Live from Toronto, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit 2018. Brought to you by theCUBE. So welcome to the Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit. Um, I'm about to hand you over to John Furrier, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of SiliconANGLE Media and executive editor at The Cube. Um, he's about to do a fireside chat with uh, Alan Matthew. I'll let him introduce uh, them to you as well. Um, he's also involved in a major blockchain project himself. So he's going to get into that with those guys as well. So, and tomorrow we start at nine. In the meantime, enjoy the evening, enjoy the food, enjoy the chat, and I'll let you go. Okay, hello. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for um, being part of this panel, fireside chat, want to make it uh, loose, but uh, high impact for you guys. I know having some cocktails with a good time. Um, if there's any questions at, during and the end, we're happy to have, pass the mic around. But we want to have a conversation, kind of like we always do, down in the lobby bar, just talking about crypto and cloud. We end up talking about cloud computing and crypto a lot because those are two areas that are kind of converging and the purpose of this event. So we really wanted to share some thoughts around those two massively growing markets. One is already growing and is continuing to, to be great. The cloud and blockchain certainly is changing everything. So these are two important topics. We want to flesh them out. Al Bergio uh, is the serial entrepreneur founder of Digital Bits. He's founded companies both in cloud and blockchain, so he brings a great perspective. And Matt Rozak, leading crypto investor, entrepreneur, and advocate, uh, well known in the crypto space going way back. I think he we gave a couple of bitcoins to some very famous people early on. We'll get into that a little bit later. So guys, thanks for uh, being part of the panel on Fireside. First, first question is, we know how big the money is. I mean, the money in crypto is, is flowing around the world. In cloud computing, we've seen specifically, and certainly in the coverage now with Amazon's success, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft and others, trillions of dollars being disrupted in the traditional kind of the enterprise and data center area. And blockchain is, is, is doing that too. So we want to get into that. But first, before we get into it, I want you guys to take a minute to explain for the folks, just to set the context, the kinds of projects you're working on now. Al, you have digital bits, and Matt, you're investing, and you're inviting a lot of interesting token uh, dynamics. So let's take a minute, Al, start. Thanks, John. Um, Can everyone hear me okay? All right, perfect. Uh, well, thanks for that lovely intro. Um, yeah, so my name is Al Bergio. I am uh, uh, founded a few companies, as John mentioned. Uh, before the cloud, there was the internet. And so it started for me in the late 90s um, in the e-commerce era. But more recently, I pioneered uh, what's known as Interconnection 2.0, and I did that with a company uh, called uh, Console. And it was, um, for those that may know, PCCW um, recently was acquired by um, uh, PCCW. And with that, we disrupted the way networks at the core of the internet connected together. Um, more recently, I founded uh, uh, the Digital Bits Project, and now um, the Digital Bits uh, blockchain network. And with that, you can kind of think of that as the um, trading and transaction layer uh, for the points economy and other digital assets. Um, and you can do a lot of interesting things with that. And it's uh, really uh, about bringing blockchain to the masses. So, Matt, what are you working on? So uh, Matthew Rozek, uh, co-founder chairman of Block. Uh, Block is a uh, enterprise uh, software company. We do two things. Uh, the, the, the premise is the tokenization of things. We, we think the uh, uh, money, identity, new layers of the internet are going to be tokenized. And so uh, we go to market in, in two ways. One is through Block Enterprise, and these are all the, uh, uh, the software layers you need to, to connect to tokenized networks. So think a wallet, a node, a router, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, on Block Labs, uh, we build and partner with uh, some of the uh, leading uh, tokenized networks and applications. So, so we build connective tissue, and then we actually build uh, these these new networks. Uh, I started in this space as an investor uh, over uh, five, six years ago, uh, investing in in some of the uh, best entrepreneurs and technologists in the space. Built a great network, uh, but I love building companies. And and so my co-founder and I, Jeff Garzik, uh, built uh, Block uh, two and a half years ago. Um, uh, and then lastly, also serve as chairman of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. So, so if you believe in these, these new tokenized uh, money layers, identity layers, et cetera, uh, regulation comes into play, uh, certainly today from an institutional adoption level. And so if you care about this space, you need to uh, spend time uh, to kind of help uh, that dialogue improve. This technology moves way faster than uh, uh, folks in, uh, in DC and elsewhere, so. 
And the project that we're working on, SiliconANGLE, is we've tokenized our media platform and uh, we're opening it up to a token model and to kind of change the game. And so all three of us have projects. We want to put those in context. We build everything on Amazon Web Services, so we have a view of the cloud. We also cover it. The cloud computing market is, is, is booming. We see that Amazon's Web Services numbers continue to power the earnings for Amazon as a company. Uh, obviously, Apple's trillion dollar valuation, those are clear case studies. But blockchain potentially could disrupt it all. And Al, I want to get your thoughts because even today in the news, uh, and Microsoft Azure, which is their big cloud provider, announced blockchain as a service. Um, and folks that are in either the data center business or in cloud know the shift that's happening in the IT world. But no one's really connected the dots on where blockchain intersects and also is it an opportunity for the cloud guys and, and what's the landscape look like? So what's your thoughts on that and uh, how are they connected? What does it mean? How does a cloud company maintain their relevance and competitiveness with blockchain? Well, um, just pointing on the fact that um, you know, today we had that news with Microsoft and the Azure Cloud and uh, their support and uh, evangelism for blockchain. You know, a company, I think it's very important that this isn't an ICO, two kids in a garage saying that they're doing something in blockchain. This is a massive multi-billion dollar company. And they, in making a decision like that, it's not trivial. Uh, it's many, many departments, a lot of resources before such a thing is announced. So um, that's a, not only is it validation, but it's a leading indicator as to this trend, um, that this is clearly something that's important. And a lot of people, if you're not paying attention, you need to be paying attention, um, including if you're in, 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 in the cloud industry, because uh, many companies obviously do compete with, with, uh, with Microsoft and AWS. So um, um, it's, it may be still early, but it's not that early. Uh, it's um, in light of you know in light of the news that we saw today. Um, with that, I would say that you know a lot of the parallels I like to kind of um, if I was an infrastructure provider, um, I'd look at this from the standpoint of the emergence of Linux when it first came on the scene. Um, what was important for companies like Red Hat to be successful, I mean, they had competition at the time, and um, you had shortages of Linux, let's say engineers and what have you. Um, and so uh, a company like Red Hat built a business around that. And they did that by um, and how they kind of surfaced and validated themselves to the enterprise of that era uh, was partnering with hardware companies. So it was Intel, IBM, and then Dell, HP, and they all followed. And then all of a sudden, um, which version of Linux do you want to uh, use? It's Red Hat. And who you're paying for that support? You're paying Red Hat. Um, and and you know, then, then they had their hockey stick moment. Um, today, you know, it's not about hardware companies per se, it's about the cloud, right? So the cloud is the new hardware uh, per se, and many enterprises obviously are, are looking at cloud computing companies uh, and cloud computing providers, infrastructure providers, as the company that they need to support them with um, the infrastructure that they use, or sorry, the technologies that they use, right? Because they're not necessarily supporting these things and making sure that they're always on uh, within the basement of that enterprise, they're depending, they're outsourcing, they're depending on these managed IT providers. And so it's very important that whatever technologies they're using in the lab, that ultimately um, their infrastructure partners are able to support the implementation, the integration, the on ongoing support of these technologies. So if you think of blockchain like an operating system um, or a database technology or whatever you want to call it, um, it's, it's important that you're able to really identify these key trends and be able to support your customer and what they're going to need. Um, and, and ultimately for them, they can't have a clog in, the, in their digital supply chain, right? And so uh, it's clearly emerging. Um, Microsoft is validating that today. You know, clearly they have the data um, that they're seeing from their uh, existing enterprise customers and they don't want to lose them. Yeah, but remember when cloud came out, you and I have talked about this before many times, Al, that it wasn't easy to use. I remember when Amazon Web Services came out, they, it was just basically, it was hard to, you know, command line basically, you had to use it. So it became easier, now it's so easy and consumable. Blockchain, similar growing pains, but we don't want to judge it too early with the opportunity that it has. It's going to get easier in your thoughts. And it has to scale as well, by the way, Amazon had large scale. So yeah, blockchain I mean, has to scale and be easier, your uh, thoughts. An another kind of way to think of it is to not necessarily think of cloud computing, but the evolution of the internet went, you know, in Internet 1.0, you know, we went through this dial-up modem era, things are very raw back then. Great visions we had of the future. 
well, it's going to be amazing for video one day, but you know, not during the dial-up modem era. And it eventually, you know, it eventually happened. Uh, and, uh, and user interfaces improved, and and tool sets improved, and so forth. You know, fast forward to today, we have all of that in innovation to leverage. So things will move a lot faster with blockchain. It did start very raw, but it's it's moving much faster than anything we've seen, definitely in the '90s and in the last decade. So um, that's just you know, it's a matter of uh, moments, not not uh, years. And I think uh, Al brings up a great point on leverage uh, because Amazon has leveraged its infrastructure uh, to a point where it's larger than Google, Azure, and IBM's public cloud combined. And so you got massive leverage there. And so when these big cloud uh, providers uh, provide this uh, blockchain as a service, it is instrumented and built on top of their existing infrastructure, not necessarily on blockchain infrastructure. So it's an interesting dynamic where they're, they're putting it on top of existing infrastructure that's there. Uh, but what's being built right now is a decentralized Amazon Web Services. So you have every layer of Amazon being reimagined like, uh, and, and uh, uh, incentivized. So you have distributed uh, compute and access and storage and database. Um, and so what will be interesting to see is that uh, given this massive opportunity, uh, will Amazon and some of these other incumbent cloud providers uh, become the provisioning networks of the future of all this new decentralized uh, resources that get, uh, you know, again, if, if you want storage, you have to start having smarts to say, if I'm going to go to C or Filecoin or Gennaro or, or Storage A, uh, Compute, et cetera, you have to start being a provisioning uh, layer on top of that to, to kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, make that blockchain essentially work. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see that transition because today the lightweight version is to say, yeah, I have a blockchain as a service strategy and that's like um, uh, well done and check the box. Now the question is how far in this, this, this new world will they go down and uh, as it gets more decentralized, as universities and governments, corporations plug their uh, excess utility into these networks to see how that changes. Because that is much bigger than the, than the Amazon of today. I think that's an interesting point. I want to just drill down on that, if you don't mind, because I think that's a fundamental observation that every layer is going to be decentralized. The questions I think I'm asking and I'm seeing is, what hasn't all worked together? And then what's the priorities? And the old model was easy. Got to get the infrastructure, got to get the servers, and you work your way up to the top of the stack. What cloud brings also is that a software developer could whip up an application, maybe a D app on a test network, and, and go viral, and next thing you know, they have a, a great opportunity, and then they got to build down. So the question is, what are you seeing in terms of priorities on stacks, portions of the stack that are being decentralized and tokenized? Do you see a pattern, a trend, uh, and as an investor, is there a hotter area than others? How do you look at that? Well, I, I think it's it's uh, it's in motion right now. It, it's like I said, every layer of of uh, AWS is getting uh, thought through on how to, uh, to create these digital cooperatives. I have excess storage. I'm going to contribute it to this network, and I'm going to get paid in tokens when a user uses that storage network and pays for it in those native tokens. And so. That, uh, coupled with all the other layers, is, is happening. Uh, from a user perspective, we may not want to be going to pick a database provider, a storage, a compute, et cetera. We're likely going to say, I want a provisioning layer and provision this and execute this. Much like if we, you know, there'll be new provisioning layers for uh, moving money. I don't care if it routes through Lightning or Litecoin or Doge or whatever, as long as the value gets across the pond or the uh, app gets provisioned appropriately based on you know time, security, and cost, and whatever other uh, uh, tenants are important, uh, then that's all I care about. But given the, uh, the, the depth and, and the market for all that, I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how these are uh, developed with the provisioning layers. And I, I would think Amazon or Azure, the future of that is, is more provisioning than actually going and, and doing all that at the end of the day. That's great. I want to get your thoughts, guys, on innovation. Um, my good friend Andy Kessler wrote an op-ed in today's Wall Street Journal around an article around the government, getting U.S. government getting involved in, you know, there's Twitter, Facebook, the big platforms in terms of how they're handling their, their media. But he brings up a good point that with more regulation, there's less innovation. You mentioned some things outside the United States. This is a global cloud. Clouds operate globally with regions. It's a global fabric. Um, startups are really hot in this area. So how do you view the ecosystem of startups in terms of being innovative, 
uh, the things happening that you think that are good and, and things that aren't good, obviously regulation, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the government getting involved in managing startup ecosystems, but blockchain has a lot of alpha entrepreneurs jumping in. You look at all the top ventures, the legit ventures, they're all alpha entrepreneurs, multiple, multi-time serial entrepreneurs. They see the opportunity and they go for it. Is the startup environment good? Is there enough innovation opportunities here? Your thoughts on, on the opportunity to be innovative? Yeah, Al and I were just talking about this uh, b before the uh, the panel here, and, and uh, we're talking about our, our travels in Asia, and when we go there, it is uh, 10, 100x of energy and uh, get it factor and capital, and the markets there are just uh, wildly more vibrant than uh, you know going to, this, to, to some of the typical pockets here in San Fran and New York. It's uh, in in uh, in North America, and uh, uh, so, so it's interesting to see that when you heat map the world, uh, what's really happening, and, and, and you know, people are always saying, oh, this, this FinTech or InsureTech or whatever tech is going to make a dent in, uh, in Silicon Valley or Wall Street. Uh, this technology, this new frontier is definitely going to do that. I think some of that will get um, put into more focus based on regulation, and, and there's, there's two things that will happen. There's, there's obviously a lot of whippersnapper countries that are promoting uh, a safe uh, place to innovate with crypto. Uh, I think Malta, Gibraltar, uh, Barbados, et cetera. And, and there the will Bermuda's be, getting into the mix now. Yeah, I mean, so there'll be no shortage of that. And and so, uh, and and obviously this this ecosystem outpaces the, the pace of, of regulation. Uh, and then we'll see like the US doing something or, you know, uh, other, uh, fast followers to try and catch up and say, hey, we're going to do the Cryptocurrency Act of 2022. Binders get free power, uh, tax-free, you know, crypto trading, you know, just to try and play catch up. Because uh, it's kind of hard uh, in the last year, 18 months, of seeing this ecosystem go from this, this groundswell to this now institutional discussion. And how do you back end the, the banking, the custody, all these form factors that are still relatively absent? And so, uh, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of it. It's a whole new way. you got to follow the money, right? Al, you, you and I talked about this. Capital markets, yeah. you know, entrepreneurs need to raise money, and that's a good thing. You need to get capital to do stuff. Yeah, this is a, a new phenomenon that the world has never experienced before. It's awesomeness when it comes to capital formation. And without capital formation, there is no innovation, right? So um, the fact that more capital could be raised, uh, um, it's the ultimate crowdsourcing um, uh, in, in, in such an efficient period of time, capital being able to, the, the ability to track capital from various different corners of the world mm -hmm. and deploy that capital to try to fuel innovation. Of course, you know, not all uh, startups uh, or what have you succeed, but that's, that was true yesterday, right? And, you know, 90% of startups fail, but they all were given some meaningful amounts of checks and people were employed and innovation was tried. Um, and every once in a while something emerges that's amazing. If you can do that faster, right, more, you know, we have the opportunity to produce more and more uh, innovation. And uh, of course, you know, with, with something so new as cryptocurrencies and uh, things like ICOs and, and what have you, um, people may kind of refer to it as the wild, wild west. It's not, it's, it's an evolution. And you have it's still the wild west. Though. You got well, it, it is, but you know we're 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 getting better at it, right? As a as a as a as a world, this isn't the Silicon Valley uh, community getting better at venture capital, or some other part of the United States or Canada getting better at venture capital. This is the world as a whole getting better at capital formation. Yeah, that's a great it, point. A new m way of capital formation. I want to I just uh, get an uh, observation on that. Uh, I moved to Silicon Valley 20 years ago. And um, I love it there you know, for venture capital and doing startups. It's the best place in the world. And I've seen people try to replicate Silicon Valley. We're the Silicon Valley of, of Canada. We're the Silicon Valley of the East or Europe. And there, no, it's always been hard to replicate because it was a venture model. And you needed venture capitalists, you needed money, you needed community, the, the, the culture of failure and starting over and, and just you know, get back on the horse kind of thing. Crypto is the first time that I've seen the replica of that Silicon Valley dynamic in a new way because the money is flowing well, they, and there's community yeah. involved in crypto. Crypto has a big community aspect to it. Do you, you guys see that as well? I mean, I'm seeing outside the United States a lot of activity. Is that, is that something that you're so seeing? The first time we saw, well, the last time we saw um, everybody trying to replicate Silicon Valley was the first internet. You know, there was Silicon Swamp, there was Silicon Alley, there was Silicon this. Prairie. Every, every city was Silicon Beach. a Silicon version of something. 
and then the, the capital evaporated, right? We had a, a mass correction happen. Um, what, what wasn't being disrupted was the value exchange, right? And so this has been created now. Um, it is now possible for this to happen, and it's happening. We're seeing amazing things, as Matt said, you know, in Asia. Um, it's a truly awesome force. If anybody has an opportunity to go, they should go. Uh, it's unbelievable to experience it, and it really opens your eyes. Matt, you've lived through a lot of investments during those dot-com days and, and through history now. You've seen a lot of different things. Your observations of the current state of the capital formation, the startup landscapes, the global ecosystem around crypto and how it's different from, say, venture or classic rolling up companies and those kinds of things. Yeah, you hear a lot of this, uh, you know, uh, it, we're in a bubble, it's speculative, et cetera. And, and I think um, when you look back at history of, of infrastructure, whether it's railroads, telephony, internet, and, and now crypto uh, and blockchain, um, it's interesting, like uh, if you said it would take this amount of money to innovate and come out the other end of internet with this kind of infrastructure, with these kind of applications, with these kinds of lessons learned, nobody would sign up for that number, right? It creates, it, it needs this this fear and and greed and and all the effervescence of, of, uh, of markets to kind of come out the other end and have innovation. Um, I, I think we're going through a very similar dynamic here with uh, with crypto and blockchain, where you know everything is getting tokenized, everything everything is getting uh, decentralized. Uh, although we're we're talking about fundamental things like money, you know, it's it's not like we're talking about pet food and women's shoes and and airline tickets. We are talking about money, identity, things that will enable like other curves to, to really uh, come into focus like Internet of Things and 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 the the, the kind of compounding of intersections if uh, when some of these things get right is pretty extraordinary. And so, uh, but, but I like what, what, what Al said in terms of capital formation and that friction to get from, uh, you know, idea to, to capital to building. Uh, it's getting compressed. Yes, there will be uh, edge cases of, of people taking advantage of that, but at the other end of this uh, of this flow uh, will be some amazing innovation. What do you guys think about the, if you had to be pushed to one answer to the question with one, one uh, answer uh, of what is the high order bit of why blockchain is so important? I mean, for me, I see it from my standpoint, I'll just start. I see it uh, making inefficient things more efficient for all, any use case that, that's being reimagined, which is everything from IoT or whatever. Efficiency is a big thing, at least I see that. What do you guys see as a high order bit in terms of, you know, the, the one thing that you say blockchain really impacts the world in terms of, you know, impact financial, et cetera? Well, I think with decentralization and all these things that we're seeing, it's kind of even the playing field. It's allowing for participation where um, parts of the world were unable to participate. I mean, it's doing a whole lot of things in that area. Um, and that's truly awesome, to really grow the economy, grow the global market, and the number of participants in that market in all areas. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the ultimate trend of what's happening here. Yeah, and your and, yeah uh, absolutely. I, I think there's two things. There's, there's this blockchain dialogue, and then there's this crypto decentralization, tokenization dialogue. And, and on the blockchain side, uh, you have lots of, of companies engaging in, in uh, blockchain and trying to figure out how it applies to their business and, and you hear everything from McKinsey and Goldman saying financial services will save $100 billion in, in uh, uh, operating expenses by applying blockchain technology and that's great. That is uh, probably low in terms of what they'll they'll save. It to me is just not the point of the technology. I think that uh, when, when you kind of uh, distill that down to say, hey, uh, for a group of folks to use this technology as a shared services thing to lower opex at trading and settlement and decrease that, that that is great. That is a step stone to uh, creating these tokenized economies, these digital cooperatives. Meaning you contribute something. And then you get something back, and it's measured in the value of this token. It's like a barometric kind of uh, value of how healthy that ecosystem is. And so, you know, uh, regulated public uh, enterprises, and you see consortiums around insurance and financial services and banking. That is all fantastic, and that gets gets them in the pool, gets them uh, exercising on what blockchain is, what it is, and how they apply it. Uh, but it's at the end of the day for them, it's cost reduction. The minute there's growth or IP or disruption on the table, they're all going back uh, to their boardrooms to say, hey, let's do this, this, or that. Uh, but 
if there's a way, uh, my, my favorite class in, in college was industrial organization. And it sounds weird, but <laughs> it was. It kind of told you like how to dissect an industry, you know, what makes them competitive, who the market leaders are, and then uh, if you overlay like blockchain networks with tokens with incentives, interesting things could happen, right? Uh, and so, so that future is going to be really interesting to see how market leaders think about uh, how to tokenize uh, their network, how to be, how to say, no, I don't want to own this whole industrial uh, network. I have to engage with some other uh, participants and make sure everybody is incentivized to 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 climb on board. So that that I think is going to be more of the interesting part than just blockchainifying a workflow. Well, let's let's just quickly drill down on that token economics. What you're getting to. So let's assume. Blockchain just happens. Is evolution of technology, let's just assume for a second that it's going to happen in a big way. Is private, public, hybrid chains with all that good stuff happening. But the token economics is where the business value starts to be extracted. So the question for you is how do you describe that to someone uh, to look for? What are the key elements of token economics? When, is it, when does it matter? When is it in play? And how should they be thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, token economic design and uh, getting a flywheel going to create a network and network effects is really important. You could have great uh, technology, um, but Al could be a better marketer and he gets uh, tokens adopted better and uh, his network will do better because, you know, he was uh, better able to get people to, to adopt and market a particular, uh, you know, layer application. And so, it's really important to think about how you get that flywheel going, how you get that, that kindling going on a, on a particularly uh, new ecosystem and get users adoption and growth. That is really hard to do uh, these days because some people don't even know what, what Bitcoin is, let alone to say, I'm gonna tokenize this layer and every time you contribute, every time you uh, take an action, you're gonna get rewarded for it, and you're gonna share in the value of this network. Can you give a good example of what's happening today you can point to and say that's a great example of token economics? Well, you see, I mean, the, the most basic one is uh, uh, shared file storage, right? You know, it's like uh, the Filecoin C uh, Gennaro model where, you know, you, you contribute, you know, the unused storage in your laptop or your university uh, data center or uh, corporate data center, and you say, I'm gonna contribute this, and when it's used, uh, I get these tokens, and uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, or week, or, or or year, you see what these tokens are worth, and was that worth your contribution? And and so, as these markets develop, and as utility develops, uh, we'll we'll see, uh, you know, what that uh, what that holds. Al, you got an example you can share? Um, yeah, digital bits is a good use case. Actually, obviously. I'm not going to use digital bits <laughs> just to be neutral. Um, this is one that Matt will, will know very well, uh, definitely better than I, but one that I, uh, I think, you know, the simpler something is, the easier it is for people to understand, and it's like, oh, that makes sense, you know. Um, you know, Binance is one that's very simple. You know, it's a payment token. Uh, if you pay with some other currency, uh, you pay, uh, you know, price X. If you pay in the next few years with, with uh, their token, uh, you'll get the service at a discount. And in addition to that, they're, um, they're using a percentage of profits, um, I think it's every quarter, to buy back up to, ultimately up to 50% of tokens that are in circulation. So, um, you know, it's driving value and driving return in, in, in essence, to, if I can use that word. Um, so for a user, it's simple to understand. For someone that likes to speculate, it's easy for someone to understand um, in terms of how the whole model works, right? So it's not, some insanely complicated mathematical equation that we can, yes, we can trust the math. Um, um, and so in some cases, uh, some adoption is gonna just be adopt, you know, will, uh, will attract participants based on simplicity. Uh, in other cases, the math is important and, and people will care about that. So, um, um, you know, not all um, uh, things are necessarily equal and, and not necessarily one method is right. Um, but there are some simple examples out there that, that have proven to be successful. That's awesome. Um, one last question before we open it up to anyone who has any questions. If anyone has any questions, they want to come up, uh, we'll grab the microphone and ask, ask the three of us if you have anything on your mind. Uh, while you're thinking about that, I'll get the final question for these guys is, um, a lot of people ask me, hey, I want to be on the right side of history. Which side of the street should I be on when the, the reality comes down that decentralization, blockchain, token economics, decentralized applications becomes the norm and re that reimagining 
actually happens. I don't want to be on the wrong side of, of history. What should I be doing? How should I be thinking differently? Who should I be following? What should I be paying attention to? How do you answer that question? Uh, I think uh, on the basic level, you know, uh, turn off your phone, lock your door, and study this technology for a day. It's the best advice I could give. Uh, two, buy some crypto. Once you kind of have crypto uh, on your phone and your wallet, something changes in your brain. I think you just uh, feel like you check the prices every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, lose, you lose a lot of sleep, um, uh, and and then uh, after that, uh, you know, I, I think you you start engaging in this space in a in a very different way. Uh, so I think. Uh, starting, uh, starting small, st starting basic is, a, is an important tenant. And then, uh, wh what's amazing about this space is that it attracts the best and brightest out of uh, industry and law and government and and uh, uh, technology and, and you name it. And uh, I'm always fascinated with the people that show up and uh, they're like, yeah, I've been a I've been a 20 year uh, you know veteran in this space and I want to get into blockchain. It just attracts some of the best and brightest. And um, I, I think. Um, we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, experience coming into the space. You know, this has been a you know what I'd say a, a bottoms up um, uh, groundswell of of crypto and blockchain and and the evolution of the space. And and I think we're starting to see more uh, some more mature uh, folks come in the space to to add some history and perspective and 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 be, be uh, helping the build out of this and the build out of these networks. I think. The, the kind of intersection of both is going to be very healthy for the space. Al, your thoughts? Um, I definitely agree with Matt. Um, you know, definitely to lock yourself up and just try to absorb information. You have, everyone has access to the internet. Um, there's plenty of, of information. If you don't like to read, go watch a few YouTube videos and just people explaining this stuff. It's really fascinating. There's various different use cases and so forth. Uh, you definitely have to buy, buy some. In you know whether it's five dollars worth, uh, just go through the whole experience of being able to trade something of value that you know a few years ago didn't exist, and to be able to trade it for something else of value is is, is pretty phenomenal experience. Then try to go buy something with it; it's even more uh, of a fascinating experience. You just bought something that used again something that didn't exist a few years ago. Um, but what I would add to that as well, it's you really have to get out there. If you keep surrounding yourself with people saying, "Oh, this is," Uh, whatever it's it's, uh, it's never crazy. Gonna work. It's for criminals <laughs> and all that fun stuff. Um, you're going to be last place, and um, so coming to conferences, obviously, futurist conference can meet a lot of interesting, great people, um, and that consistent experience uh, you'll you'll learn uh, something every time. You know, at the end of the day, I remember, and I'm sure all three of us remember, with the birth of the internet, there was many people that said, you know, the internet thing, it's crap, it's for kids, you know. And we had first movers, we had the willing followers, and then the unwilling followed. You don't want to end up being the unwilling. Uh, yeah, the unwilling. Yeah. All right. Does anyone have any questions that'd like to ask? Okay, come on up. Yeah. We're for recording, so I want to get it on film. Uh, so I have two questions. The first one is for you, Al. Um, two years ago, I interviewed with IIX before it was console, and I want to know why you didn't hire me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, that's a joke. Um, actually, I, I thought uh, each of you had brought up some good points, uh, minus you, Al. Um, but I, I'm just kidding. But what I really wanted to ask you guys is, so you talk a lot about this, uh, the tokenized economy and kind of uh, the roadmap and the things to get there. You talk about settlement layer, right? Fiat to crypto settlement layer, your identity protocols, um, your dApps, XYZ, right? The whole Web 3.0 stack. I want each of you, or I want at least input from both of you or all of you, what are the hurdles to getting to a full adoption of a Web 3.0 stack and make a bold prediction on the timing before we have a full Web 3.0 stack that we use every day? That is a awesome question, actually. Uh, timelines. Um, you could be, you know, at, being in technology, being in venture, you could be right and you could be off by three, five, seven, ten years and be so wrong, right? Uh, and then at your retirement dinner, you could say, hey, I was right, but timing wasn't great. Um, so this is really hard technology uh, in terms of building systems that are distributed, uh, creating the right uh, economic models, the, the incentive models. Uh, it takes a lot to go right and in the intersection of all this. Uh, but it's not a question of like, 
is this happening? No, this is happening. This is like, it's in motion. Um, uh, the timelines are going to be a little elusive. I'm way more pragmatic. I was one of the you know early guys in the uh, the early internet, and and you know everything was going to be dot com and awesome and fantastic. And um, but the timelines were a little little elusive then, right? You know, it's like when was uh, people were thinking of today's Amazon was going to be the 2005 Amazon. You know, it's like that took about another decade to kind of get there, right? And people could easily just buy stuff and a drone or a UPS guy would just deliver it. And so similar things apply today. And, and um, uh, you know, at the same time, we all have, you know, a supercomputer in our pocket. And so it's a lot different. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're dealing with, with uh, 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 trusted mediums, right? The medium of money, the medium of identity, the, all these different things, they're, they're, tr they're uh, there are things that, you know, if, if I say, hey, download Instagram and let's share cat pictures or, or uh, whatever, it's not a big deal. Our, our trust is really low for that. Let's do it. Um, for money, it's a different mental state. It's, it's a different dynamic, especially if you're an individual, a government, or an enterprise. You go through a whole different adoption curve on that. So, you know, it's, it is uh, at grand scale, it is, you know, five to ten years, right? Um, in, in, in any meaningful way. Uh, and so we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, my answer to that st uh, question is a good one because the, uh, your question was a good one. My answer is a little bit weird because it's multi multi-generational. The first, inter the first generational pivot was when the internet was born, it was because of standards, right? The government had investments. The OSI model, Open Systems Interconnect, actually never happened. The seven layers didn't get standardized. Only the few key ones did. That created a lot of great things. Uh, and then when the web came out, that was very interesting protocol development there, the TCP IP stuff, I mean the HTTP stuff. I don't, I don't see the standardization happening because cloud flipped the stack model upside down because Amazon, these guys, let the software developers drive the value. It used to be the infrastructure drove the value of what, what software could do. Then software became so uh, proliferated that that drove the value of the infrastructure. So the whole cloud computing equation is making the infrastructure programmable for the first time, not the other way around. So the cloud phenomenon is all about software driving the value, and that's happening. So it's interesting because with blockchain, you can almost do levels of services in a cloud-like way with crypto, I mean, just with blockchain and, and token economics, and have a partial stack. So I, I think that it, the, this whole Web 3.0 might be something that no one's ever seen before. So I, I, that's kind of my answer. I don't really know the, if that's going to be right or not, but just looking at the future, connecting the dots, it's probably not going to look like what we've seen before. Uh, and if the cloud's an indicator, it's probably going to be some weird looking stack where certain sections are working, and then evolution might fill in the other one. So. I mean, that's my take, I mean, but standards will play a role. Someone, the communities will get, have to get involved around certain things, and I think that, that's a timeless concept. And what's the timing? That's your question. Oh, timing? I think it's gonna be pretty quick. I think if you look at the, the years it took for internet and then the web, everything's being compressed down, so the, I think it's gonna be much shorter if it was 20 year cycle in the past. That get, this gets shortened down to 15 with the internet, and then this could be five years. So five to 10 years. Uh, you know, that, that could be the, the impact in my mind. I mean, the question that I always ask is, what, what year will banks no longer be involved in anything? Is that 20 years or 10 years? <laughs> exactly, so yeah, follow the money. Um, so I, I would say that um, in, in, in terms of trying to keep your finger on the pulse with things and, and how you kind of things I, um, see things evolve, things are definitely moving a lot faster. Um, you know, in the past, I would, you know, you would probably say seven to ten. I, I, I'm not sure if I would say five, uh, sorry, five to ten. Uh, it definitely feels to me that it's five, you know, max that we can start to see some of these um, key things that uh, fall into place. So, what was the first question? I, oh. We've mapped it before. Sorry. <laughs> I have a question. This is Dave Vellante, co-host of the Cube, and um, I want to pick on, uh, up on something, John. You just said, and Matt, you were talking about uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. It's not about them saving hundreds of millions of dollars. It's really about them transforming businesses. So, and John, you just asked the question about banks. I want to actually get your answer to this. Will traditional banks, in your opinion, lose control of payment systems? Notwithstanding your your bias, 
Yeah, I, I am. I am definitely biased on this, uh, but I mean, I, uh, I I've been in front of uh, uh, the C-suite of banks, credit card companies, etc., and I said, you know, the, uh, in in about a decade, the the center of what you do and how you make money is going to be zero, and because there will be net networks and ways to transmit money that'll be. Uh, by far cheaper, or will be subsidized by other networks, meaning, and those networks are Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, you know, uh, Tencent, wh whatever networks that are out there that are engaging in collaboration and commerce and everything else, they will give away payments as just a courtesy, like people give away messaging or, or email or something, as a courtesy to that network. And we'll harden that network, uh, and it'll be based on, it'll be built and based on blockchain technology and uh, uh, crypto uh, currencies, uh, so don't have to necessarily worry about you know how to you know kind of uh, settle payments. Uh, but these new networks will start to encroach on banks. The banks are not worried about other banks today. The banks should be worried about these new networks that are being developed. How many people still have a home phone line? Yeah. <laughs> that was elegant. Right. I, I like mean, that. So, you know, I mean, there's a generation of people that still like going to banks. Um, they'll keep them in business for a while. Um, but I think that comes to an end. I mean, I think that the, uh, when we covered a lot of the big data um, market when it started, the argument was um, mobile will kill the bank's um, outlets. And now with ATMs, there's more, bank, more banking branches than ever before. So I think the services piece is interesting. And, and also, if you look at even the, the, the cloud base, the, the uh, software as a service SaaS space, uh, a decade, decade and a half ago, you would ask uh, SAP, Oracle, what have you, uh, what's your cloud strategy? And they'd be like, cloud, that's, that's this more efficient delivery uh, model, not interested. 90 some billion dollars of M&A later, uh, SAP, Oracle, et cetera, are cloud companies, right? And so if, if, uh, if banks kind of get into that same mode to say, well, yeah, we're, we need to play catch up and buy uh, digital currency exchanges and, and multi-currency wallets and some of these, this, this infrastructure and plumbing to be relevant in the, in the next world, that would be interesting, but I think Technology companies have as much of an advantage to do that as as financial services companies. So it'll be interesting to see who uh, uh, kind of goes into that. Um, it goes into the the crypto ecosystem to to make that their own. It's interesting. I was we were talking before we came on, and uh, the OSS market, operational support systems, is booming, and that's traditionally been these big operational outsourced companies would manage big projects. But if you look at um, in the first half of 2018, there's been a 20 mil, greater than 20 billion dollar commercial exits of companies through private equity mergers and IPOs around OSS. And that's where we see operational things happening. CoreOS, Alfresco, MuleSoft, Pivotal went public, uh, Magneto, GitHub, Treasure Data, uh, Fastly, Elastic, Data Stacks, they're all in the pipeline. These are all companies that aren't cloud. They're like running stuff in cloud. So this is if this could be a tell sign that potentially the, the blockchain operating market is going to be potentially a big one. Yeah, and then even look at uh, Bitmain, the world's largest uh, uh, miner uh, in in um, crypto. So they um, they did about a billion dollars in profit last year. Did about a billion dollars in profit just in the first quarter, going public. Just raised a billion dollars last month uh, at a you know reportedly fifty to seventy billion dollar valuation in Hong Kong in the next month. And and the amount of money they'll raise will eclipse what Facebook raised. And so I think the, the institutional, the, the hardware, the cloud computing, the, the whole ecosystem starts to like uh, resonate and, and think about this space a lot differently. And, and we need these milestones, we need these, uh, whether they're role, role, role models or, or data points to kind of like uh, think about how this is gonna affect your business and what you do tomorrow morning. Uh, any more questions from the crowd audience? Okay, great. Well, thanks for attending. Appreciate you guys watching and listening. And guys, thanks for the conversation. Cloud and blockchain convergence. Collision course or is it going to happen nicely, Al? What do you <laughs> uh, I, I think it's just all fine. Nice. No, it's yeah, I think it's going to be a, um, a convergence. I don't, I don't see it necessarily as a collision right. course. And Matt, a lot of money to be made on this opportunity these days.
than cloud convergence with blockchain. Yeah, no, I concur with Al. I think there's going to be convergence. I think uh, some of the smarter players will engage and figure out their, their models in this new, uh, this new crypto and tokenized era. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Give you guys a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks.